seated if you want to. We love you, Lord. We love you. We know that you are our high priest. Hallelujah. You are a high priest that you have no beginning of days and no ending. You are the high priest of all high priests. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you from the beginning to the end. You loved us. Hallelujah, Lord. You brought us in to you and you loved us, Lord. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Lord, we can speak your name. We can believe in your name. We can trust. Tis so sweet to trust in your name, Lord. We love you, Lord. We exalt you, Lord Jesus. Just raise your hands and worship him. Exalt the Lord most high. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise. Praise you, Lord. We, ex we extend our love to you, Lord, because we know that you first loved us. While we were yet sinners, you died for us. And Lord, you're, a lot of your gospel's a mystery, but we know we're received in the beloved. We know that you love us, Lord. We know that we're complete in you. Lord, we know that neither death nor life nor thing present or things to come can separate us from you. Lord, you, you came and you were the perfect sacrifice. You said that what those goats and heifers and bulls couldn't do every year, Jesus completed it. You said you weren't even pleased with that, but when Jesus came, he wanted to please you. And he was your pleasure. Lord, we take our pleasure in you. Just say that, Lord, I take my pleasure in you. Lord, you are my pleasure, Lord. You are good for me. You're more than enough. You are the final sacrifice. We don't have to consider another thing except believing on him whom God sent. That's your biggest challenge is believe. Just believe. Believe on him who God has sent. Say, I believe. I believe on him. I believe. I believe. I'm going to just open up and I'm going to step right into my believing. And I'm going to, you know, he said to cast down every wicked imagination, anything that exalts itself above the name of Jesus. Anything that tells you, oh, that's not real. Oh, I just cast that down. Y'all, their evil thoughts will try to bombard your mind. How many had a few this week? How many got your challenge? And you know, I can get it. I don't watch any of that National Geographic and biblical archaeology trash because, you know, they'll make you question what you believe. Well, we really didn't find that ark. Well, we really didn't do this. Well, we don't know if they really put that cross up on that on Calvary. You know, they'll make you not want to believe it. Don't watch it. Just somebody, <laughs> she's dead now, so I can tell you. She, she thought she was doing us a favor because John she knew John loved the Bible and she got us this subscription to Biblio, Bibliarchaeology. And I thought, well, I was going to read it. You know, she paid for it and I felt obligated or, you know, I will do this. I read the first article and I, I questioned, was the Bible true? I read the second quest, article and I questioned if I was saved. And I read the next article and I questioned everything, <laughs> everything. Like, are we really here? Are we, you know, I threw that away, and I didn't tell her, but we just tossed them every time it ran out. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> you will be challenged in your mind. The, that's why the Bible says to guard your mind. That's why the Bible says to cast down wicked imaginations. You will be challenged if you're in this world, because there is that power here. The devil, he's very real, or, you know, Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross and fix us all. But you, you know, you just cast it out or throw it out of your house. <laughs> Hallelujah. Pretty good exhorter, ain't she? I was looking at her through the camera lens. She got pretty blonde hair this morning, don't she? Wow. Scripture says this concerning what she's talking about. Be careful lest at any time you are spoiled through philosophy there's a lot of philosophical stuff if you don't believe it just get on facebook i saw that little post that said don't you wish your life was really as spiritual as your facebook posts say they are <laughs> don't you wish your marriage was just as good as as everybody says their husband is i believe though in saying the desired end result be, be careful lest at any time your heart become spoiled through philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world, 
and not after Christ. Because in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus. Jesus. I went and talked to an old boy that uh, had my guitar worked on. I found an old guitar hung in the cabin. An old boy did the repair for me. Good guy, I like him. I've got me a new friend. And uh, he asked me, where your church at? And I thought, yeah, he don't want to know. So I didn't answer him. In a few minutes, he said, you didn't ask me about where your church is. I said, it was over near Greystone Power. In a minute, it came out. I said, I, said, uh, I got a good feeling in your music store here, brother. It feels good. Tell me about you. He said, well, I'm a Hebrew. He's of that sect of believers that the Hebrews came down through Morocco and black people are Hebrews. And uh, Hebrews were people of color and all that. I just let him talk. He's probably watching. Hey, Zach. I know you've been watching, brother. I know you're looking. People are always drawn to the light. I got some questions to ask him. What do you do with sin? You gonna go sacrifice a goat? What do you do with sin? If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer sprinkling over the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, then how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, who offered himself up without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant. That by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions which were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. <laughs> I met a Baptist minister recently. Stopped by and saw a car in his yard which leads me to an announcement here in just a minute. Saw an old car, an old 62 Impala in his yard, and I was looking at it, and he came walking up, and as he, he's far as for me to the front doors out there. As he's walking up, my belly fluttered. I knew then he was, I knew he was, he was a Christian. He got within shouting distance of me. I said, <laughs> how you doing, brother? <laughs> come find out he was a Baptist pastor. He's not pastoring right now. He's always been, been bivocational. And he told me real quick, he said, I just want you to know, he said, I, I, he asked me about my church and what we were doing, what we believed and all that stuff. And we didn't get into detail. He said, well, but I've, I've always believed in once saved, always saved. And, and I looked at him, I said, you know, I don't know why people have so much trouble with that. Pastor, do you believe in once saved, always saved? I believe this. I believe you're not super sinner. And I believe that you can't break past the blood of Jesus. He'll keep pursuing you and he'll come after you and he'll seek you. He'll knock you down. He'll run over the top of you and he'll come after you again. And there'll be more grace. He gives more grace. He gives more grace. Ask James chapter 4. He said, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Do they not come hence of your lust that war in your members? He said, you war and you fight and you desire to have and you try to get and try to obtain and you fight and war, let you, yet you have not because you ask not and you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it on your lust. And then James said, you adulterers and adulteresses. And he's called them. I mean, you think James was just an old covenant preacher. And then he, you can almost see him roll his eyes when he says, but he gives more grace. Somebody say, thank God for more grace. Just more grace. More grace. He did it for me, didn't he, for you, Kim? <laughs> I'm here by the grace of God. So what are you here by? Some other thing. Train load of grace. His grace is amazing. I speak grace to you. Grace. Grace for forgiveness. Grace for healing. Grace for blessing. Grace for your marriage. Grace for your kids. Grace for your finances. Grace for your life. Grace for your mind. Grace for your sleep. Grace for your sleep? Somebody's having trouble sleeping? Go to bed by faith. 
Expect to sleep. We were at a funeral a few years ago on a windswept hill in Mableton, Georgia. Bright, sunshiny day, partly cloudy. Winds were out of the southeast at about 12 miles an hour. <laughs> it was not bright, shining sun, but partly cloudy. It was. Scattered clouds. Sun was shining down on us. <laughs> well, it's subject to change. You know how you know weather is. We were up there and it was when we laid Josh's grandmother, Carol. We were sitting there. People were all sitting, I was standing there. Talking about her, she was born at the crossing of Haight and Ashbury in San Francisco. And she had had a life. And the scripture said, all of our days are as a tale that is told. And her days were certainly as a tale that was told. She had lost a leg. She, she used to, uh, and I was telling this, on that windswept hill as we were getting ready to lay her to rest. I said, she used to manage four Shoney's. One restaurant can tax you. She was overseeing four. And she smoked, smoked, and smoked. It's the only way she could get any kind of peace. She just chain smoked. And the doctor said, you're about to lose your leg. If you don't quit smoking, you'll lose that leg. She said, Pastor John, I couldn't quit smoking. And sure enough, I lost my leg. And they put a prosthesis on her. She had a prosthetic, learned how to walk on it. She said, but you know what? I learned how to quit smoking. <laughs> That's what she said. And uh, so I told her, I said, well, you know, I'm back at work no more. No, that's too much stress. I said, well, four Shoney's is hard. Don't you think you could probably manage one IHOP? And she said, you ain't right. And she come up and hugged me. I was telling those stories about her. I still see her face. Don't y'all see Carol right now? I see her. And then at the end, as we, were, as we laid her to rest, just as before we were getting ready to leave, I just looked up at the sky. I said, y'all, let's all look up. That's where Carol went. She physically left her body, but she looked the same. And she came out of her body and came up, floated above her body, up into the clouds, past the clouds, into the starry space, past the starry space, and into heaven and saw a whole bunch of kinfolk and relatives all ready to, to receive her. They done got her house ready and decorated it like she wanted it. And I got to thinking, just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. When I said that, there was an older lady that I didn't know sitting on the front row. Come to find out it was Josh's other grandmother and she hadn't been able to talk because of Alzheimer's. She said, to a land where joy shall never end. I, I saw everybody look at her, fly away. And I was looking at her, I thought, ah, so she and I sang it. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more lazy days and then I'll fly away in the morning when sing what's it? a land where joy shall never end. Sing it. I'll fly away. You realize how soon this is? I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. 
it's not going to be long. It's not going to be long. I mean, that fast, and I'm 58 years old. I still feel like I'm a kid, but I'm not that fast. And they say life is a lot like a roll of toilet paper. The more you roll it off, the faster it rolls off. You've heard it? So listen, he didn't put you on here to mully grub and grind out your life and be depressed all the time and finally die and everything be wonderful. No, he put you on this life to be an example of light and blessing and victory and laughter and blessing so that when you do pass on, there's a big dark hole somewhere. Well, what happened? You're so full of light and life and liberty and blessing and laughter and somebody say, yes, get up off of that thing and dance so you feel better. Just telling you, just telling you. Did you know, and I said this, Kim, I said this a few weeks ago, and I can't really improve on it. I'm trying to find a way to say it better. Jesus, Janie said it in her exhortation, perfectly pleased the will of the Father. It pleased the Father to bruise him. And after, Jesus was literally born again in the pit of hell. That's where his new birth happened. Can you, can you remember where you were when you got saved? Jesus can tell you exactly where he was when he got saved. When he got born again in the pit of hell, I'm telling you, it scared the Pewali D out of every demon. And suddenly the light shone. And he came up through that place into Tartarus, the, the, uh, the place of comfort where Abraham's bosom was, where there were captive people, captive people kept by promissory note that could not go to heaven after they died, but they, they couldn't, they were not condemned to hell. They were in that place of comfort. And he preached the gospel to them there and set the captive free. The scripture says that many bodies of the saints which slept arose and were, it went into the holy city and were seen of many in Acts 27. He wasn't the only one resurrected that morning. All the kings of Israel, all the, the godly kings and all the godly people all came out of the graves and, the, and Jerusalem was flooded with people amazing story in it. You listen to me. This is a great, great gospel that we preach. It's full of light and life and liberty. And inside you is a pearl of great price. There's a cauldron of blessing that's constantly flowing and it will heal your body and it will, it will cause people around you to get born again. It will. It'll cause it. Uh, in a few minutes, Mr. Alexander's going to come up and give some announcements. After I get through preaching. And I'm not trying to audition for Kim. I can't wait for him to come preach. Are you kidding? <laughs> Hadn't heard him in a year or so since the summer of last year. So I'm ready to hear him. Two quick announcements. Two very quick announcements that I want to make first. First of all, it came to my attention some six months ago or so that we as a church are out of compliance with Georgia state law regarding weapons carrying in our church. And so what a church should know about weapons in the church is under the Georgia Safe Carry Protection Act of 2014, July 1, made significant changes to Georgia laws dealing with guns and weapons. Now, I won't go into the details of it today because we're in a different flow, but in two weeks from today, two Sundays from today, say two Sundays, two Sundays. from today, okay. immediately after service, we're going to hold a class for weapons compliance concerning carrying on church property. Now, we are out of compliance. And if something were to go down, which I, I declare to you today that nothing will ever go down, but should it ever Pastor John would be totally liable. And I'm not going to be liable. We're going to keep this. And we're going to become compliant. And we're going to be, and I'll tell you, for you weapons carriers, it's good news. And for you non weapons carriers, it's good news. So we win win. But there'll be a discussion here two weeks from Sunday. It'll give me time to talk to my board concerning this. The 2014 Georgia General Assembly passed House Bill 60, known as the Safe Carry Protection Act. The law, effective July 1, 2014, makes significant changes. To Georgia laws dealing with guns and weapons. The article discusses the impact of HB 60 on places of worship and churches in Georgia. Now, these will be available to you on the four-year table immediately after, for those of you that are interested in, in getting the information. And then there are some uh, 
big, the biggest thing is that I have to, as a pastor and leader of, of this house of worship, I have to sign off on and and agree to as to who carries inside this building and if they carry. If I don't say okay, then it's against the law for anyone to carry except for a duly appointed law officer that's sworn in. Now, so again, the details of that will be uh, two weeks from now, and it's very much worth your time to be here immediately after service and, and hear uh, what we have to do to become compliant. And uh, amen. Amen. I know this. Georgia is no, law, no different than any other state. In the past 10 years, because of the domestic violence that's been going on, churches are number three in the soft targets, top 10 soft targets in America. Churches, number three. We are going to harden up here and not be a soft target. In fact, we'll be able to sniff them out before they ever show up here and know them. I tell you, Rico's the best I've ever seen at. He'll walk up and shake hands with you before you know it. You've been hand shook. You've been patted down. He'll find out real quick if you're carrying. And you'll think he's just telling you which direction to go. All he's doing is feeling around on you, see if you got a weapon on you. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he's caught a few. Oh, you carry a weapon? I see you carrying a weapon. What is that, a 9 millimeter? The guy looked at him. Well, it's not. It's against the law on the state, on the, on the property of the church. You can leave that in, in your vehicle, please. And then come on in and let's worship the Lord. Isn't that sweet? That's the first announcement I need to make. I have a second announcement. Yes, Lance Alexander, give me the picture. Here it is. You must know. There's a new fellowship starting at Church on the Word. It starts in October. Yes. It's about to happen. I almost want to say drum roll, please. Beginning in October, the Blue Collar Cruisers are starting a fellowship here at Church on the Word. It's a fellowship of old vintage vehicle enthusiasts. The reason we call it Blue Collar Cruisers is because rather than invest $100,000 in an old car like a lot of people do, you can find one. I don't care if you push it, pull it, drag it. You get it to the house. All it needs to do to be compliant with Blue Collar Cruisers is for it to run, drive, and stop and be safe. And you can wash it. It needs to be clean. I don't care if you don't have windows in it. As long as you're compliant with the law of safety, the blue collar cruisers are going to cruise in. You need to notice, this is only one example of there will be not one but two 57 Chevys. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Mine is a two-door post 210. Harold's is a two-door hardtop Bel Air. Once they are all sanded and primed and ready to go, they will terrorize the two lane black tops of the United States once again. Yes. Our inaugural ride will be to from here all the way to Sweetwater Creek State Park. We don't want to go too far to start with because if they were to break down, we're not just completely needing to call the law to come get us. And once vehicles prove that they can stretch out, we'll go to other places. They'll be in, 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 uh, uh, joint with uh, the Thunderbolts, and I don't care what you drive, I don't care what it is, I don't care if it's an old pickup truck or an old motorcycle, I don't, you can blue collar cruise with us. We're going to go to Sweetwater Creek State Park, we'll back in, we'll throw out a barbecue grill, and we'll have a fellowship, and that'll yeah. be our first ride. And the reason for it is this, not just because we like old cars, old vehicles get people's attention. And they walk up, and they want, and it seems like the unfinished it is, the more unfinished it is, the more attention it gets. And they come up and they start talking to you. And once they do, then Jesus will come out of you. It's going to be a tool that we will use. And for those of you millennials and Generation Xers that believe that cool marched on and left us in the dust, Harold and I plan to make a trip to downtown Atlanta to the next Justin Bieber concert <laughs> where they're all lined up waiting to get in. And when we pull in, Every girl there is going to drop her jaw. All the guys are going to want to drive it, but we're going to leave them there frustrated when we drive away, and they'll know that V8 cool. V8 praise and worship. It, <laughs> <V8 laughs> <laughs> That's when they'll know that cool existed long before they were born. Just thought I'd let you know. All right. Jay Alexander, come on up here and give us some more announcements. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Andrew's got my announcement sheets. Let me. Ah, how about that? There we go. All right. In service this morning. Uh, I have a very short announcement sheet because the main announcement we've had for the past few weeks is that this Sunday Kim Clout will be here. In case you didn't know, so. Kim Cloud is with us this morning. I think you need to give him a hand. We're looking forward to a phenomenal, phenomenal service. Real quickly, just some housekeeping items. Every Wednesday night, we're continuing with our free hamburger and hot dog meal. If you'll email us or call us and let, let us know you're coming, it really helps us out because we know how much food to cook and, more importantly, how much food not to cook. So that is a Wednesday night from 6 to 6.45. We also have a Bible study. We have a class for the kids. We have a class for the junior youth. We've just started a new book in junior youth that is excellent, and uh, that is all going on on Wednesday night. We are also now committed on Wednesday night, since school is in, that we will be out through the door at 8.01. Got it? So it ends at 8 o'clock, and we will be out the door at 8.01 so kids can go to bed. So that's Wednesday night. Uh, uh, the dinner starts at 6, service is at 7. Uh, we do have uh, recorded CDs of the service available in the back. If you would like a copy, you can purchase one. And our adult Sunday school class is every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Also, just as a uh, uh, note here, everybody remember several weeks ago, we took the junior youth on a mission trip to Blue Ridge, Georgia through Team Effort. And we just got this in the mail. This is from Team Effort. And it says, Dear Church on the Word family, Team Effort wants to thank your church for sending the youth to serve on a mission trip in Blue Ridge last week. Obviously, we got it. It wasn't last week, but you get the idea. On a mission trip in Blue Ridge. They rep represented your church well as they built a pole barn, and you can be proud of their accomplishments. We know many lives in Blue Ridge were changed for, the, for their words and actions. It was exciting to see you put your faith into action. Because, their work, because of their works, many lives were changed, both in the people we worked with as well as the participants in the group. The team effort staff thanks you for supporting your youth group on their summer mission trip. We enjoyed serving alongside them, the team effort staff, and then everybody that we met up there, Katie, Nathan, Abby, and Wren, they all signed this letter to us. So we wanted to let you know that they were blessed, we were blessed, everybody was blessed as a result of that, and that's how it should work right? So really, really cool. And uh, it was a neat, neat experience. Neat experience. Who's ready to honor the Father with giving this morning? Amen. If you need a cash envelope, please raise your hand. These gentlemen are coming forward and they can serve you. Just so where there's no misunderstanding, everybody is aware this is the normal tithes and offerings for church on the word, right? All right. If you brought something to give Kim, we are certainly going to receive an offering for him later on. This, you don't put it in this offering, okay? Lift our hands. 
hands. Father, we thank you for this morning's tithes and offerings. We thank you for being able to give. We thank you that we are blessed so that we can be a blessing for you giving to us so that we can give and that we can pour out of ourselves for your glory and for your benefit. We thank you for that this morning, Father. We worship you this morning with our giving, with our tithes and offerings. We honor you and we thank you for this time of the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Gentlemen, you can serve the people. said, we're right on time, y'all. Before I bring Kim to the pulpit, I want to share with you that uh, some years ago, my nephew, Philip Burge, uh, landed a good job with a company that was going to take him out of state. He became the Wichita lineman. That's a line because our, our good friend, um, Glenn Campbell, passed away this past week and Thank God he's finally got freed up. Right. We loved him. He was a minister of the gospel. Most people don't know that. That's right. He was called to the gospel, called to lead worship. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but anyway, we, took, we were talking about Philip becoming the Wichita lineman and all that. He learned uh, how to climb poles and, and set poles and do all the un, unenergized work. And then finally he got his energized license where he can handle lines that, have, that had to be taken off and, and then re-energized and all that and made some good money. But the problem was he was leaving Georgia to do it. And so when I found out where he was going, I got on the phone and called our good friends Steve and Cheryl Ingram. Steve Ingram down in uh, uh, Orlando, pastors of church. He used to lead worship for Brother Copeland for about 12 years. And uh, I called him and asked him if he would uh, see to my kids while they were gone. And Steve saw to him and did just a fabulous job. I saw him at the Believers Convention last week, and uh, he thanked me and asked how they were since they were moving back. Uh, uh, Y'all stand up, kids. Uh, they're home now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they decided, he decided just to go ahead and pull the plug on that job down there and move home. His wife Young wife has a mom and dad live right here. He has a mom and dad live right here. There's nothing wrong with going home. Did you know that God gave a man a family first before he gave him a ministry? He gave Adam Eve before he gave Adam a ministry. He gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a family before they were given ministry. Family, that's why they're home. And I believe he'll land the next great job. I believe he'll make more money than he's ever made. I believe that he will... Um, that they together will walk right in the middle of the will of God yes. for their life. I believe they'll find the house of their dreams that'll be easy to pay for and pay off. And I believe in the Lord's timing, they'll reap what they sow with regards to children in the future. Don't you? Y'all give them one more hand. Yes. Good to have you back. Good to have you back. <clears throat> well, you've heard him before. Some years ago, I saw Kim Cloud and realized that he was the descendant of the Cloud Indian family that I used to watch on television on Sunday morning during the Gospel Jubilee. And come to find out, that, come to find out, that's before I was saved. 
And even though my dad was not a spiritual man, we never missed the gospel jubilee, the happy jubilee every Sunday morning. And uh, the, that, the, the cloud Indian family, this guy with a big long regalia would come out and they'd sing and they'd preach and do stuff like that. Come to find out Kim Cloud was kin to them. Found out that he was a gospel singer, gospel preacher, and a fabulous musician. He's always blessed us. He's back here to bless you again. Please welcome Kim Cloud Amen. to the pulpit. Amen. Which one is that? Tell them I'm going to just use that one. Okay. He's going to use this one. Cool. Hey, thank you. Uh, great story. How many of you ever saw the gospel singing Jubilee? Uh, I don't know if I've told you this story before, but uh, when my family had gone there, I was a little kid one or two years old, they call me the Little Indian because the other groups, they didn't carry their kids on the road, but uh, that's the law in our family. I grew up on a bus, didn't have a house till I was seven. I still sleep better in a bunk going down the road at 80 mile an hour than any bed that sits still, and if I smell diesel fuel, I get excited. Um, so we would do the Gospel Singing Jubilee three, four times a year, and if you ever saw the show, it's live television, by the way, they had one set here where whatever groups, they usually have two or three groups, that were singing, they would perform right here. There's a wall built, and immediately on the other side is another set, a functional kitchen set, like a, a cooking show. Because, how many of you remember that the sponsors were Martha White Flour and a dairy, I forget which dairy it was, but they would have, someone would come in early, five, six in the morning, and make an entire plate of biscuits with Martha White Flour that were set over here at the kitchen set. So... That particular day, Cloud Family's up singing. My grandfather was watching me. I don't know if you've ever left your kids with your grand, you know, their grandparents. Uh, he was supposed to be watching me. I'm wandering all around, two, three years old. And I wonder, and I see the plate of biscuits in the kitchen. And how many of you know there are some problems in life only a biscuit solves? <laughs> That's my story. I clearly stick to it. Um, I see those biscuits, and I start walking towards them. Meanwhile... The producer's about to have a conniption, and he's saying, of course, off camera and quietly as he can, somebody stop the little Indian. He's going for the biscuits. J.D. Sumner and the Stamps were the other group. How many remember J.D. Sumner and the Stamps? You know, J.D., Guinness World Book of Records, lowest recorded voice in the history of mankind. And so J.D.'s on there, and he sees this whole thing go down. So he goes and grabs me. I've already got the biscuit, and I'm eating it. He sits down in a stool, and they, what they would do is after the groups were over, then they'd have a commercial for Martha White Flower, and whoever the groups were would usually do the commercial. However, because I've grabbed the biscuit and started eating it, J.D. picks me up, puts me on his lap, and he tells the camera, come right in here, come tight. So the camera comes right in on him. He goes, look at this. I'm eating a biscuit, oblivious to the fact that it's television. I'm eating a biscuit. He goes, look at this little Indian. Look at him eating that biscuit. He said, you know why he likes it? Because it's made with Martha White flour. He said, I bet you've got some little Indians at your house who would like a biscuit with Martha White flour. So it was the commercial. So later I did the chocolate milk one too. And then every time we did that show, the little Indian did the commercial for Martha White flour. So the fact that it was live TV, uh, sings, none of that meant anything to me. It was just biscuits and chocolate milk. Uh, so if you ever saw that show, and by the way, uh, my family's in the Gospel Music Hall of Fame, uh, which you can go visit, by the way, which incredibly now is in Dollywood. Dollywood, uh, Dolly Parton loved gospel music. If you know her story, that was a real part of her life. And she said, I want to build a new Hall of Fame. I'm going to put a museum next to it. She said, I'll pay for the whole thing myself. She said, the only deal, she told the Gospel Music Association, she said, I want it to be inside of Dollywood. And she said, no one will have to pay extra. If they pay a ticket to get into Dollywood, they can see it for free. So if you go to Dollywood, as soon as you walk in the front gate, directly in front of you is the Gospel Music Hall of Fame and Museum. So my wife and I were there when they had the, uh, what do you call it, the ribbon cutting. Dolly was there and it made a big deal. And they have the Blackwood Brothers' entire bus inside of the museum, by the way, which you can walk through. But I was so excited because my wife hollered to me, come here, come here. She said, there's a TV about a 1960s era console television playing with a continual loop of the gospel singing jubilee so i thought the commercials you know so well they added the commercials out so i didn't get to see the little indian but if you grew up that way like i did that was great fun i grew up in church how many of you here grew up in church as i told you my family did gospel music 116 countries they were in brother my dad did it for 63 years 
My grandfather, his dad, who started the Clown family, preached 78 years. Can you imagine that? 70? He was married for 72 years to the same woman. <laughs> Dropped a mic. 72 years to the same. You know that's God. Uh, huh? Well, that's the interesting thing. He and Grandma both lived to be 98. His name was Reinhold Clout. Her name was White Corn Little Soldier. He's full blood German. She's full blood American Indian. And they fell in love. You know you're German if your name's Reinhold Clout. <laughs> and you know you're Indian if you White Corn Little Soldier. By the way, he told me, he said, you know, he said, your grandmother, White Corn, had a sister. You know what her name was? Yellow Corn. Absolute truth. And I said, what was your father-in-law's name? He said, Popcorn. <laughs> So that's how I grew up. But how many of you know just because your daddy's a preacher don't mean you're a Christian? My dad was a preacher. My grandfather was a preacher. I was a hell raiser, just to be frank with you. Grew up in church, alcoholic, drug addict by the time I was 15 years old. I used to think, how, how did I grow up with parents that were sincere and real, and I'm selling drugs at 15? And the Lord said something to me, and I want you to listen. The Lord said, your problem, son, was you were overexposed but under-responsive to the truth. And he said, that's a recipe for a hard heart. Overexposed, yet under-responsive to the truth. How many of you know, look at me, everybody look at me. How many of you know it'd be better for you to never hear than to hear and not respond? Because once you've heard, you're accountable for it. And that was really my life. And I ran my life into a pit. Anybody here run your life into a pit? One person, the rest of y'all gonna lie in church, are you? That's your deal, okay. I did, uh, but how many of you know his love goes deeper than any pit you were in? Remember Corey Ten Boom's book, The Hiding Place? She was so angry at this German officer who was over them in the concentration camp, so cruel. She wanted to hate him, and her sister said, Corey, it doesn't matter how deep, how deep the pit his life in because his love goes deeper still. My life is a testimony to that, that as deep as a pit as my life was in, God's love went deeper still than my pit. Allowed me 39 years ago, began to serve him in full-time ministry. This, this month, in fact, marks my 39th year of full-time ministry. Uh, the first 10 years of that was in staff ministry right here in Atlanta, a church called Mount Perrin. And then for 29 years after that, I've been in full-time travel ministry. So incredibly, I'm in a different city and state every week. I get the unbelievable privilege of traveling around and representing him. I'm so glad to be, I'm in Douglasville, right? I'm so glad to be in Douglasville today at Church on the World with my dear friends, John and Janie. Yeah, that's crazy. I, a lot of times I don't. Um, but I'm, I'm delighted to be here. How many of you here are glad you're here? How many of y'all here, you know, when you, I know I'm in the right house when I got a pastor telling this, the etymology of get up off of that thing. I know I'm in the right place. Uh, how many of you came here this morning expecting to have a good time? Some of you didn't raise your hand, so I don't know if you didn't expect to and you're shocked. Or if you're still, you know, in the church I grew up in, nobody smiled until somebody said, you're dismissed. <laughs> They'd wake up and then smile, you know, where are we eating? How many of you know today we're having a good time not because we're getting out, we're having a good time because we're in? Yeah. Say it, I'm in. I'm in. Say it again, I'm in. I'm in. Let me hear you say, I'm in the house. In. How many of you know what we're calling the house? How many of you know this is your house? Yeah. Say it, this is my house. Is my house. Let me hear all the ladies say it. Let me hear the men say it. Everybody in the room say it. How about those of you back there at the sound booth? Let me hear y'all say it. Very impressive. Add this to it. Let me hear y'all say, this is my house of destiny. This is my house of destiny. How many of you know that's what this is? You know, from the time I was a little kid, they told me God's got a plan for your life. How many of you remember being told that? I thought, that's awesome, until I realized they tell every little kid that. That kind of dumbed it down for me, to be honest with you. But then I understood that was the magnificence, magnificence of God. He literally has a plan for everybody. But how many of you know it's in the local church? Right here that that plan is revealed. God will speak through the man and help his, God's plan for your life to be revealed. But then how many of you know he'll use the people around you? Everybody look at the people around you. Go ahead. Some of y'all been wanting to look at them for a long time. So go on, I'm giving you an opportunity. Preacher said you could. Look at them. 
And know this, God's going to use these people around you to help you fulfill your destiny. That's why the local church is so important. That's why having a pastor in your life is so crucial. You will never, I'm using the word never, you'll never fulfill God's plan for your life outside of the local church, outside of a pastor in your life. That's how God rolls. God does everything with order and purpose. How many of you know there's no freewheeling, there's no lone rangers in the kingdom of heaven? God does everything, let me hear this side of the room say, with order. With order. Let me hear y'all say, and purpose. and purpose. God does everything with order and purpose. And so it is with your life. God has an order and a purpose to it. That's why you're here. Because this is where your destiny will be revealed. Let me hear y'all say, here, here. And, only here. and only here. That's true. I believe that too. I don't believe you roam around from church to church to church. When I was a kid, we called people like that church hoppers. How many of y'all have ever heard that phrase? That alone's colorful enough. I have a new phrase for them. Actually, I came up with it about 20 years ago, but I still use it. It's an acronym, C-O-T. You know what it stands for? Christians on tour. <laughs> How many of y'all have seen them like that? I mean, they come to your church. They visit with their bags packed. You want us to take your bags? We may not be here long. How many of you know people do that? They run from church to church to church. You know, he's here this year. A year later, he's head usher over there. And a year after that, he's leading praise and worship here. How many of you know that is not how God planned and purposed the Christian life to be? Wherever God plants you, he expects you to grow. Let me hear you say, wherever the living things are planted, that's where they grow. How many of you know God planted you here? Say it. God planted me here. Can you think of one living thing that doesn't grow where it's planted? I'm going to save you the trouble. No. You've never seen a tree pick up its roots and say, I feel like I'd look better on the other side of the road. Let me just come over here. No. Even if you try to transplant a tree, how many of you know it'll never be what it could have been if you left it where God planted it? Selah. Think on that a minute. God planted you here. Say it. God planted me here. This is my house. So I'm delighted to be here. Your pastor, I know, guards this pulpit as he guards you. And so for me to have the privilege to be here, which I've had for probably 15, 20 years, I guess. I don't know just how long, a long time. Uh, so, uh, 2000, so 17 years I've been having the privilege to come here. How many of you have never heard me? Raise your hand if you've never heard me. Well, there's quite a few of you. Real quickly, he told you my name. It's Kim Clout. My wife Susan and I head up Kim and Susan Clout World Ministries. Uh, we have four portions to our ministry. We have a Bible teaching ministry. All that good Bible teaching? Yeah. I'll have a table out there with some CDs on it. Used to, in fact, I used to bring a rack full, 10, 12 CDs. I just brought two. Look at your neighbor and say, just brought two. I only brought two. Point being, I want everybody to be able to get them. I want everybody here to be able to get them. So I just brought two. Uh, we have a teaching ministry. We have a music ministry. Speaking of music ministry, give those ladies a wonderful hand that were singing and our men that were playing. Let me ask you all this. Isn't it wonderful to have people singing in church who actually can? <laughs> Gotta love that. Uh, I do a little music too. I'll give you a disclaimer ahead of time. What I do may not be typical of the church music you grew up with. Grin. Let me hear you all say, Holy Ghost Soul. And sanctified blues. We'll do a little bit of that at the end. Then we have two outreaches. Jesus said, Go unto all the world, didn't he? How many know there's many worlds in Douglasville? How many know there's many worlds in your subdivision? Some of y'all, let's be honest, how many of y'all know your apartment complex is a mission field? Some of y'all may not have to leave the house. <laughs> But the Lord gave my wife and I a very clear edict. 29 years ago, we started doing mission work. It blesses me that your youth went and did a mission trip in Blue Ridge. For 29 years, we've had an outreach to American Indian people. It isn't because that's part of my heritage. It's because, frankly, they're dying to know the truth. Literally. I don't mean figuratively dying. They're, that, they're doing that, too. But I'm talking about Literally. Did you know American Indian people today have the shortest lifespan of any ethnic group in America? 39. Essentially half of the life expectancy of any other ethnic group is American Indian people. I have people ask me, is it diabetes? It's, it's high blood pressure, isn't it? No. You know what their leading cause of death is? Alcoholism. Not automobile. They don't die in their BMW. 
They don't have cars. They literally die of alcohol poisoning. I bet you don't even know anybody that that's happened to. But on America's Indian Reservation, it is the leading cause of death. Their suicide rate is 13 times the national average. Let me say it again. They're dying to know Jesus. And so what we've endeavored to do, how many of you know this won't work? Turn and burn! I mean, if it worked, they'd be standing in line to get every church in America, wouldn't they? We've learned the only way you reach people, you have to win the right. You earn the privilege. You see, if you want to minister and witness to your neighbor, how many of you know time is the best way to do that? They look at your life, and more than what you say, they look at what you do. And over time, you win them over. In a mission endeavor, you don't have the luxury of time. You've got to do it right now. You've got a season, a week, two weeks, two weeks, ten months, whatever you've got. We found the best way to do that, the shortcut, is gift giving. You give somebody a gift, how many of you know their heart opens up? You can turn somebody's heart if you give them a gift. Every husband in this room knows that. <laughs> so what we do is we take them semi-loads of gifts. For 29 years, we've done this from the Seminole in Florida, the Choctaw, Mississippi, the Four Corners area, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. We've gone to the Navajo, the Pima, the Zuni, and the Apache. Up in the plains of the Dakotas, where I'm from, the Sioux, the Assiniboine, the Crow, the Cheyenne, and the Arikara. We take them truckloads, clothes, coats, shoes, blankets, food, over-the-counter medical supplies. All new? Say new. New. All free. Two words you barely hear in the same sentence. I don't take them stuff that didn't sell in the yard sale. God don't have a big lots mentality. God has never looked for the cheapest way to do anything. He does it with what I call Jesus class. Let me hear y'all say Jesus class. Say it with some swag, y'all. Let me hear y'all say Jesus class. Jesus class. So that's what we do. We take them gifts, and it's amazing how their hearts open up. Now, Isaac Newton said for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Agreed? How many of y'all remember Isaac Newton? Actually, if you remember him, I was going to say, y'all to share your testimony. How many of you have read about him? <laughs> how many of you are more familiar with his brother Figaro? His, he was a baker. He made cookies. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here all week, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Isaac Newton, going back to Isaac. Uh, <laughs> there'll be a graph in the back explaining that, a pie chart and graphs. Um, Isaac Newton said, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So now think about it. If we have an outreach to Indians, what would be the direct opposite of that? I'm thinking cowboys. Y'all ever play the game when you were a kid? Uh, I was the only one dying to be an Indian. Um, well, we have an outreach to cowboys as well. I'm talking about literally. My wife sings, preaches, does entire services sitting on a horse. I'm serious. She preaches the gospel using the horse as the object lesson. In other words, the entire way she presents the gospel is by sitting on a horse. She helps you to understand Scripture using the horse as the object lesson. Now, that may seem odd to you unless you've read your Bible. How many of you have actually read it? Well, then you already know. The horse is mentioned in Scripture more than any other animal. He's already used more to teach Scripture. Furthermore, how many of you here like horses? And the rest of y'all are aware Jesus is coming back on one, I trust. Uh, talk among yourselves there for a moment. Um, well, she uses the horse to teach you. And she doesn't travel with me to do that. She's able to do it right from our home. She does it on the Internet. And she does it through a newsletter. She will send it out to you totally free. In fact, we'll never ask you for anything. All we want to do is help you with your walk in the Lord. And all you have to do is I'll have a little notebook out there on a table after service. Put your email address there. And you'll start receiving it. And I'm using the word promise. I promise you it'll bless you. I promise you it'll give you insight, as Paul prayed, the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you might know the riches of his glorious inheritance. It's amazing how when the object lesson weighs 1,200 pounds, it's easy to connect the dots. You can get it. So even if you're not a horse person, you sign up, and I believe it'll bless you. Uh, I'm so delighted to be here today. I got a good word for you. Look at your neighbor and say, this is going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. I believe you're going to be glad you came. Um, the Lord gave me, I want to give you the little story behind this message. Um, I didn't study for it. 
I didn't have Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and Vine's Expository Dictionary of Greek Words and three, four translations of the Bible all out of my desk. I do that, but not for this message. In fact, incredibly, this message came while I was sleeping. It's true. Uh, I don't mean the Lord gave it to me while I was asleep. I'm talking about I was asleep, and he woke me up and gave me this message. I mean, just straight up, are you a sound sleeper? You're not. I am. My wife always says she'd have to explain the tornado to me. Um, because here's my deal. You were talking about people having trouble sleeping. I've never known that. In fact, I can't even relate. I hear people tell me they, they didn't sleep well, and I'm like, how do you mess that up? I don't, I'm serious, y'all. I don't even try. I just lay down, and it happens. Um, but I'm in a hotel room, 3.35 in the morning. I sit straight up in bed. I know that it's 3.35 because there's a clock plugged into my wall on the built-in nightstand next to my bed. If you're familiar with a hotel room, they usually have a little pad and pen by the phone on the nightstand. 3.35, I sit straight up. What I'm getting ready to share with you, God gave me like turning on a water faucet. Took about five minutes. I wrote it down, and the water faucet stopped and went back to sleep. Now, I've heard people say, I have a word for you. How many of you have ever had somebody say, I've got a word for you? First of all, how many of you know not everybody has a word for you? There are many people who have a word for you that don't have one for themselves. So I let that pass right through. And everybody comes to me with a crazed look in their eye. I've got a word for you, Brother Kim. But I, first of all, how many of you know it can't be a word if it doesn't line up with the word? So I'm reading this, what I wrote. When the, my alarm went off at 7 in the morning, I got up and read, wow. And it was literally a word. I'm talking about one word. One word. How many of you, one word could change your life? You ever been in a courtroom? Acquitted? Yeah. Or guilty? Is everything. One word can change everything. So this is one word. Now, I hope you're sitting there going, what, what's the word? What word did God give him? One word. Here's the word. The word was, drum roll, Forgetting. The word was forgetting. Now, some of you are looking at me kind of nonplussed. That's it. All this build up for forgetting. Of course, I'm looking at some of the husbands in here, and your eyes are, you've got a gleam in your eye already because you're going, I can do that. <laughs> I don't know about you. I feel like that's my spiritual gift, uh, forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you men here can't remember what your wife said 10 minutes ago? That would be me. You know, I'm always saying, why didn't you tell me? Kim, I told you three times. You don't listen. Yes. Well, I got to tell you, I'm not talking about that forgetting. Not, oh, not that forgetting. Here's what the Lord said. Look at me because I want you to get this. God said, I want you to tell my people they need to forget the most un forgettable experiences of their life. You need to forget the most unforgettable. I'm talking about the events that have shaped you. God says, forget them. The good, the bad, and the ugly, forget them. Now again, you're wondering, is that in the Bible? Let me you say it. Is that in the Bible? Say it like your brother-in-law would. Where's that in the Bible? Some of you didn't say it, you're out of the will of God. Everybody say, where's that in the Bible? Well, Isaiah 43, 18 is one place where God himself said, forget the former things. In fact, can y'all put scriptures up on the screen? Give us Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. The Lord says, forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. Verse 19, for see, I am doing a new thing. And now it springs up. How many of you know he called himself the great I am because he deals in the now? He's not the great I was. Nor does he have his mind in the future. I'm the great will be. I'm the great I am. Say it right now. So the Lord says, forget the former things. Go back to verse 18 because that's one I want to look at here for a minute. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the things here we're saying, the things of old, King James. Don't dwell on the things of the past. God told me to tell you. You need to forget. You need to forget. Now, you may be saying, well, this is Old Testament. 
Even if it was God talking. But how many of you know if God said it, it's still true today? He said heaven and earth will pass away. His word will remain the same. He said, I never changed my mind. In me, there is no shadow of turning. So if he ever said, forget the former things, what's he saying today? Forget the former things. Is that in the Bible? Is that in the New Testament? Yeah. Let's go to the book of Philippians. Philippians 3. Let's go through about verse 12 through about maybe 14 or 15. Philippians 3. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. If you don't, they're going to put it up on the screen for us here in a minute. Now, as we're looking up Philippians 3, verse 12, can anybody tell me who wrote the book of Philippians? Paul did, the Apostle Paul. Notice we say he wrote it. Did he write this with the intention of it becoming Scripture? No, we don't really think so. He was writing it as a letter to the church at Philippi, hence it's called Philippians. How many of you know he wrote letters to all of those New Testament churches? The church at Galatia became Galatians. The church at Corinth became Corinthians, and so on. Parenthetically, why didn't he just go and talk to him? He's in prison. He can't. He has to write. So he writes them letters. Now, how many of you know, if you write a letter and it becomes Scripture, you know who you are? You the man. You the man. Does she ever call you the man? She does? Impressive. He answered affirmatively, and, 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 and I like, he said, of course, and you said, of course. Very impressive. Look at him right now, just so we can all see that that's true. Look at him and say, baby. Look at him, baby. <laughs> Tell him, say, you the man. You the man. <laughs> Let's do this, because some of y'all enjoyed that more than you should have. Every wife here, look at your husband right now. Look him right in the eye. Don't look at me. Look him right in the eye and tell him, girls, let me hear you say, baby. You the man. I wanted to hang there on baby. How many, I mean, if my wife ever starts a sentence, baby, I get kind of lightheaded and start staggering. I do anything. She said, baby. Girls, things that go th better with all of us, if you just start sentences occasionally, baby. You the man. Tell him again. Look at him, ladies, and tell him, you the man. You the man. Now, understand this. We know you're just being biblical, calling that that is not as though it were. We get it. But things go better. With, we're all friends at supper time, right? I mean, it goes better for all of us if you just start that way. Well, you know, if you write a letter and it becomes Scripture, who are you? The you the man. So who wrote the book of Philippians? Paul. The man. One person. One person paying attention this morning, very impressed. Of course, she's a pastor's wife. How many of you know pastor's wives know everything? It's true. <laughs> she said amen. I like that. So who wrote this? The man did. So when we read this, understand, this isn't somebody at work said this or something you heard on television. I forget, I read it somewhere. No, this is the man talking. This is the man. This is the guy who writes letters and they become scripture. That guy. Look what he said. He said, it's not as though I'd already attained or were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I have also been apprehended. Look at verse 13. He says, brethren, I count myself not to have yet apprehended, though parenthetically I write letters and they become Scripture. But this one thing I do. Let me ask you, how many things is he doing? Is it a five-step process? Is there a syllabus? A workbook? No. It's just one thing. What is the one thing, church, he's doing? He's forgetting. One thing. One word, change your life. Forgetting. Now, what is he forgetting? Those things which are behind. And why is he forgetting those things which are behind? Rest of the verse, what's it say? So that he can reach forward to those which are before him. Many of you have been living in yesterday, yester month, yester year, or incredibly perhaps, yester decade. And today, God's saying, let it go. You need to forget it. 
You need to let it go. So today, I'm going to share with you what the Lord gave me. I wrote it down. Four things God wants you to forget. Four things specifically God wants you to forget. And this is probably a pretty good order in which to forget them. I'm serious. And I want you to write them down. Even if some of you don't have notes and paper together, you're looking at me like, I'm spiritual, I remember everything. No, you don't. Some of you have to look up your passwords. So... I want you to write this down. If you don't have pen and paper to do it, look at somebody next to you and look pitiful. They'll probably pass it along to you. But I want you to write this down for yourself. Four things God said you need to forget. Number one, first thing God said you must forget. God wants you to forget your sins. Now, you may say, well, that's pretty uh, rudimentary, isn't it? Isn't that the Christian life? It is. But how many in this room have ever hurt somebody? How many of you have ever hurt somebody so bad it impacted their life beyond the moment, maybe even over their lifetime? And if you've hurt somebody like that, that can be hard to forget. Sometimes your sins don't hurt anybody else. They hurt you for a lifetime. Even though God forgives, many times he allows the consequence to remain. Because it's consequence that teaches a lesson. Wave your hand if you know what I'm talking about. So your sin can be something that's very difficult to forget. But that's the first thing God wants you to forget. Forget your sin. Let me ask you, why would God want you to forget your sin? Uh, Exactly, short answer, because he has. God will never ask you to do anything. He hasn't already made a way for you to do it in advance. The only reason God wants you to forget your sin, He has. And there was much rejoicing. Aren't you glad? God has forgot your sin. Now let's go back. How many of you know He couldn't forget if He hadn't first forgiven? Agreed? Now let me ask you, don't answer out loud. Don't answer out loud, but use your brain think. Does God have to forgive us? Well, now think about it. First of all, just use your common sense. Do you think you could make God do anything? Because I said so. He doesn't have to. Fact is, he chooses to. And what is it that allows him to forget our sin? Well, the Bible says the death of Jesus. As you address this morning in your announcements and in your exhortation to us, we're no longer, it's not about bulls and heifers anymore. It's not about goats. The ultimate sacrifice, the one-time sacrifice has already been made. The price for sin has been paid by Jesus. But let me ask you, don't answer out loud. Just think for yourself. Did Jesus have to die? Well, the fact is we know he chose to. It was a choice. Is that in the Bible? In fact, the night before he died, how many of you know he prayed? He actually said, Father, if there's a way for this to pass by me, let this cup pass. But not my will, but yours. Jesus chose to die. And because he chose to die, God could choose to forgive us. You see, life is all about choices. Look at me again, because I want you to get this. Everything in your life that has you where you are right now, totally a function of your choices. Whether you left the house today with a big smile on your face, or you got up this morning with your inner Eeyore coming out. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Oh, no. All of that, a function of your choices. Not only your choices, but the people you've chosen to bring into your life to let them influence you. All about choices. I don't know why this happened. Well, yeah, you do. Because all we have to do is look at the etymology of the choices you've made, and that's brought us to where you are. If you understand what I'm saying, wave your hand like this. Yes, it's all choices. Even with God, God chooses to forgive Because Jesus chose to die. When he had no sin, he became sin. 
So understand this. You can forgive yourself because God chose to. And you must. God said, tell my people they need to forget the most unforgettable experiences of their life. Your sin. God wants you to forget your sin. Let me hear you say, I choose to forget. forget. That's right. Does God have to forget our sin? No, no the choice. He literally chooses to forget. In fact, the Bible says, here's how he said it. He said, I will put you as far as the east is from the west. Now, have you ever contemplated this? How many of you know there's four directions? We've got east and west, north and south. So why didn't he say, I'll put you as far as the north is from the south? Well, yeah, it is further because how many of you have ever driven north? Just imagine this. Here's the earth. You're driving north. Forget that there's water. It's just all land for my little story. You're driving north. Well, it does get cold. Uh, But how many of you know, eventually, if you keep driving north, what's going to happen now? Pastor's wives know everything. You're going to drive south. So you see, it wouldn't be all that much to say as far as the north is from the south because eventually the north becomes south. But God said, I put you as far as the east is from the west. What happens if you start driving east? A strong. God said, that's how I forget your sin. From one extremity to the other, from infinity to infinity, I have chosen to forget your sin. Let me hear y'all say, that's good. Say it like Andy Griffith, y'all. Let me hear y'all say, that's good. Say it and shake your head when you say it. That's good. Uh, Young lady, did you shake your head? Did she, sir? I didn't either. Let's look at her now. Everybody look. Sweetheart, let me hear you say, that's good. Okay, she did shake her head. All right. Don't make me come back there, y'all. So God wants you to forget your sin. Say it. I choose to forget. forget. Number two. God said, tell my people they need to forget the sins of others. Now, we all know this is a little different deal here. How many of you have ever had someone hurt you so bad that it impacted your life, maybe even for a lifetime? That's hard to forget, isn't it? In a room this big, in this many people, I'm just real, let's be real. There's people in this room who were abused as a child. And I don't mean just physically, I'm talking about sexually. How many know that's the kind of thing you don't tend to forget? You're right. I had totally forgotten that. No. That's the kind of thing that can hang on you like an anchor into every move, into every new job, into every new relationship, every new house, every new decade you live. That can follow you. That can overcome you if you allow it. But God wants you to know today, he wants you to forget the sins of others. If you've been hurt, if you've been done wrong, maybe it wasn't a mom and her dad, maybe it was a husband. If you've been abused by a husband, that's hard to forget. But today God's saying, you need to forget it. You need to forget. Can we talk here? Hasn't it robbed you long enough? Huh? Hasn't it robbed you long enough? Aren't you ready to say, enough! This does not have to mandate my outcomes in my life any longer. This does not have to shade every way I look at my future again. This doesn't have to impact every way I look at another person again. I'm going to let it go. You see, that's what you must do. You need to let it go. Everybody show me your index finger. Wiggle it like this. I know you got one. Sir, in the back, where's yours? Thank you. I said, don't let me come back there. Wiggle your finger. Now, take it and tap your chest until it annoys you. See me all pretty easily annoyed, aren't you? Come on. Say this to yourself. Let it go. That's what God wants you to do. God is saying, let it go. 
Now, let's be honest. If you've been hurt, if you've been done wrong, that's the kind of thing we tend to hold on to. We move from house to house. We call in the movers. I'm tired of packing myself. I want you all to pack it. I'll pay you well. Pack it. They come in. That's my grandmother's china. Double pack that. Double pack that. And I'm watching you. My father gave me that. Double pack that too. And then they come to bitterness and unforgiveness. And they say, what about this? No. That's special. I'll be taking that with me. We bring unforgiveness and bitterness with us everywhere we go unless we've obeyed God and we've chosen to let it go. God wants you to forget the sins of others. Now, how many of you know like God, you can't forget until you've what? Forgiven. Do you have to forgive? No, you don't have to. I mean, let's be honest, some of you, that's been your lifelong thing. I don't have to. He didn't ask. He may never. He doesn't deserve it. Do you? You know what's incredible? We have unforgiveness towards other people. We hold on to resentment. But is it changing their life? No. She's doing BOGO on shoes today. <laughs> she is so and showing somebody the beautiful uh, deal she got on a pair of shoes. Meanwhile, you're... <laughs> Isn't impacting her a lot. Controlling your life. Let it go. God wants you to forget the sins of others. Well, I may forgive, but I'll never forget. How many of y'all have ever said it? How many of you at least heard it? How many of that's where you heard it? <laughs> That's what I heard. God wants you to forget. Now, let's be real. In the natural, as we've already acknowledged, that isn't anything you just wave a wand and you forgot. No, it's a choice. How many of you know that's a choice you make every day? Wave your hand and say, I know that's right. How many of you know just because you forgot, chose to forget yesterday? Don't cover today. Forgetting. It's true. It is a loop. It's a continuous loop in our life. Where you, go through. you mentioned earlier where you said cast down the main imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. What he's basically talking about there is you need to change your mind. How many of you know in order to forget someone else's sin, you're going to have to change your mind? Everybody put your hand on your hip. You know I'm looking at you, sir. That's right. Put your hand on your hip. Is yours on your hip, sir? Put your hand on your hip. Now, everybody get kind of a sassy look. Let me hear y'all say, I've changed my mind. mind. How many of you know in order to forget, you're going to have to change your mind? Now, ladies, let's look at the bright side. You've got a head start. Because let's be honest, that's your spiritual gift. If they ever had an encyclopedia that had the changed mind, they could have my wife's picture. Because I am convinced it's her spiritual gift. She changes her mind frequently about everything. Uh, Over the years, we've painted houses. Well, I'm saying we euphemistically. Uh, We has never painted anything. One of us paints, you understand. The other one just stands back and evaluates the job. What's incredible, however, is she will get to looking at a wall. I get nervous I ever catch my wife looking at a wall. Because I know what's coming next. Kim, I want us to paint this wall. And you know what color we paint it? Whatever color she decides. However, a year later, she may be looking at that wall again. And I'm thinking to myself, there's dirty work afoot here. Kim, I want us to paint this wall. We just painted it. I've changed my mind. Now, in the early years, when she would say things like that, I would say, well, I haven't. (laughs) But I was just talking big, brother, because how many of you know if she changes her mind and you don't, you're swimming upstream? (laughs) Clearly. And over time, I have learned to go with the flow. Much easier. So now, do you know how often I change my mind? Exactly. Every time she does. 
and we're both happier for it. Uh, my grandfather, who was married 72 years, I used to ask him, how do you stay married for 72 years and you're always so happy? He said, oh, it's easy. He said, I just do whatever she tells me. <laughs> God wants you to change your mind. Put your hand on your hip again. By the way, that's one of the CDs I brought today. I've changed my mind. The world wants you to think you are what you eat. Is that wheat gluten? You're eating wheat? That's pure cane sugar. Do you realize what that does in your body? So concerned about what you put in your mouth. How many know the Lord said it isn't what goes in you that defiles you? It's not what goes in your life through your mouth that controls it. It's what comes out. It's what comes out. For life and death is in the power of the tongue. How many of you, in order to change how you talk, you got to change how you put your hand on your hip? Say it. I've changed my mind. That's what God wants you to do. In order to forgive those who have hurt you, you're going to have to change your mind. And how many of you know just because you changed your mind today don't mean your mind's changed tomorrow, does it? No. No. It's a daily thing. Let me give you a little... uh, analogous situation here so you can get this how many of you ladies here today did your hair this morning Mm -hmm. there's a couple y'all don't have your hand up really really are you wanting the rest of us to believe that you got up and stumbled into the bathroom this morning walked in there and looked and said well i'm going with that i'm going with that come in here baby it looks like an s don't it look at it. it looks like a capital s i'm gonna go with that No, I know better. I live with one of you. My wife will say, what time are we leaving? Well, we need to leave at 8. Okay, Kim, set your alarm for 5.30. 5.30? Get behind me, Satan. No, set your alarm. I said, set yours. I I don't know how. Well, let me show you. No, don't show me. Just set yours. Somehow, nearly 40 years later, we're still doing it that way. I set my alarm so she can get up at 5.30. And the alarm goes off, and I'm shaking. I'm like, what? 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 It kind of dawns on me. Oh, yeah. As I see her going to the bathroom, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I know I got another hour to sleep. But just about the time I fall asleep, I hear, and I'm thinking, is that a Dremel tool? That sounds like a circular saw. What is she doing in there? I don't know what she's doing in there. I've never been bold enough to open the bathroom door and look. If I did, I feel like she'd be in there with a welding helmet on with sparks flying. What do you want? I can tell you this. Whatever she's doing in there, she's going to do it all again tomorrow. And that's the way your thought life is. Every day, you've got to take captive your thought life. It isn't just you're forgetting their sin today. You're going to have to do it all again tomorrow. Wave your hand and say, I know that's right. God said, tell him you need to forget the sins of others. Philip, stand up, brother. Y'all know what he's thinking right now? This is the second time I've had to stand up, and we just came back to this church. What is wrong? And I don't even know this man. What is this about? Let me ask you something, Philip. You ever been hurt? Did you deserve that? Short answer, no. No, you didn't. So what happens when you get hurt? You can get mad. You can feel like a victim. And you could sit down and explain it to somebody and say, so they say well, and they'd all get you've been victimized. What God's saying is, you need to change your mind. Say this to me, I've been hurt. No, just fill it. I've been hurt. I've been done wrong, but I didn't deserve that. They might have victimized me, but that will never define me. Because I met him, and he changed everything. I am not a victim. I'm a victor. It's my choice. I agree with him. He said it. Now I'm saying it. I'm a victor and not a victim. Amen. Amen. Y'all give Philip a hand.
stand up. Y'all know what she's thinking. I'm nearly four rows back. You're not supposed to call on people in the middle of the building. What's your name? You ever been hurt? Like everyone else in this room. Did you deserve it? No. But it happened. So what now, Jeannie? What are we going to do? Are you just going to be a victim? No. Because, say it, I met him. And he changed everything. And I don't have to look back anymore. Because my past does not govern me. I'm a new creation. The old things have passed away. I'm a new creation. I live in the now. I'm blessed now. I'm blessed now. Show everybody your hands. Show them. Show them the front and the back. Tell them, say, look at these hands. Tell them, say, I got blessed hands. Tell them, say, everything I touch prospers for his name's sake. Tell them again, these are blessed hands. They're not the hands of a victim. They're the hands of a victor. Tell them about your feet. Tell them, say, I got blessed feet too. Tell them, say, everywhere I go, God gives that ground to me. Wherever I put my feet, God gives that ground to me. Amen. Y'all give her a hand. Now, I don't, I don't know these two people. I don't know their story. Well, why would I pick them out? Because for me to tell you these things isn't going to change your life. When you say it. Amen. See, no doubt your pastor's taught on these things too. But you may, some of y'all are sitting out there right now with a poker face. And you're thinking to yourself, I don't believe that way. I don't believe just because you say something. I don't. I mean, he's big and he's funny and all, but I don't believe that. And you may not. Some of you don't believe me. And you know what? When he's taught on it, you didn't believe him either. But not one time. He and I have fun on the phone. I'll guarantee you this. But he has never called me and said, Kim, they don't believe me. (laughs) And I've never said back to him, you know, I had the sense when I was there. They didn't believe me either. (laughs) No. And yet we both know some of you don't believe us. But you see, we know why. See, some of you don't believe me for the same reason you don't believe him. You know what that reason is? Because you don't believe God. And if you don't believe God, I know you won't believe me. But there is somebody you always believe. You. Incredibly, you believe you when you know you're lying. (laughs) Come on, y'all. You can quit playing poker for a minute. You believe you when you know you're lying. Some of y'all have told the same lie for so long, you're convinced it's true. Just because you said it. That is the power of your mouth. If you say it, your ears go, did you hear that? That's what we believe. He said it. He's the man. That's why God wants you to change how you talk. It isn't enough to change your mind. Now you got to change how you talk. And it starts when you say, I choose to forgive. Now again, I don't have to. No, you don't have to. It's your choice. You can hold on to it if you want. But Ed, tell them what they'll get if they do hold on to it. Kim, I would be happy to. The first thing each of you will receive, a shortened lifespan. Fewer and fewer friends. Years of anger management. The constant doubling of your medication. Occasional irregularity. And all this can be yours if you just hold on to it. Now, who's going to sign up for that? People do every day. They hold on to bitterness and, uh, you ever been around somebody, because clearly it's none of you, but have you ever been around somebody that if you do something wrong, they immediately go, that reminds me. <laughs> I 
You did this before. You did it in 92. Again in 97. I think we both know what happened in 2001. I'm not even going to go there. Although I am going to tell you, I put a hit out on you in 2001. Really. And the only reason you're breathing out, the check bounced. And I changed my mind. You did it again in 2004, 8, 9, 11, and now you've done it now. You ever been around somebody who gets as angry today yeah. over something that was 17 years ago? Yeah. God's saying, I hadn't robbed you long enough. Huh? I can answer for you. It has. But it will continue to rob you until you say, enough. Starting today, I choose to let it go. Everybody look at me. When you forgive, it doesn't change the past. Nothing can. Do you know what it will forever change? The future. When you forgive, you're not changing the past. You're changing your future. You're enlarging your future every day you say, today is another day I choose to let it go. Anybody here from New York? What part, brother? Rochester. Uh, I want you to culture these uh, butter bean country people here, brother. Because I know in Rochester they would say, forget about it. But for me to say it, I'm just pretending. I'm from North Dakota. Let me hear you say it on three. One, two, three. Forget about it. Forget about it. Let us all follow his lead. Everybody on three. One, two, three. Forget about it. That's what God wants you to do. I don't think I can. Yeah, you can. He has. You can. It's a choice. How many of you here have ever been in an automobile? Excellent. I didn't know. I want to be sure I got the right demographic. So you're all familiar with an automobile. Uh, how many of you are familiar, if you sit in an automobile looking forward, what's ahead of you? A windshield. A large, clear piece of glass. Now, upon further inspection, you'll find there's a much smaller piece of glass, reflective in nature, that allows you to do what? <laughs> to look back. The rearview mirror. Now, how many of you here would drive your car using only the rearview mirror? None of you? No. How many of you know you wouldn't even make it out of the parking lot? What's the name of the road out here? McCowan. How many of you know you wouldn't make it onto McCowan? You'd be the next one in line to pull out, and you'd boom, hit the person in front of you, who moments ago was blessed and highly favored, but now they'll get out of their car and say, what's wrong with you? What do you mean, what's wrong with me? Well, you hit me. Oh, I didn't see you. What do you mean you didn't see me? I'm right in front of you. Well, that's what threw me. Because I'm always looking behind me. None of you in here would drive your car like that. People live their lives like that every day. And tell them, brother, what's God saying they ought to do? Forget about it. Forget about it. Everybody say it on three. One, two, three. Forget about it. Number three, third thing God said you need to forget, your failures. Once again, so I'm sure I got the right group of folks. How many of you here have ever failed? Raise your hand if you've ever failed. Uh huh. So all of us have essentially, agreed? In other words, there's nobody in here that just, I don't know, at three years old got on a bike and rode it. Give me that. I'm going to ride it. No. How many of you remember learning to ride a bike? They say, once you'll learn, you'll never forget. What I'll never forget was learning to ride. Because you see, my father taught me. Air quotes, taught me. Let, me. let me elaborate. What he did was he waited until my mother went out of town. And then he said, boy, get your bike. And I said, Daddy, are you going to put my training wheels on that my cousin gave you? Training wheels, shmaney wheels, get your bike. And then every man in this room knows where he took me. Even some of the women know. Of course, pastor's wives know everything. He took me to a hill. 
And men, tell the women in this room, what did he do? He pushed me. He released me on my own recognizance. Ride, boy. That was it. That was his instruction. Ride. And for like eight or nine feet, I did. Till I realized I was. And then I turned it and dumped it and started crying. And who was I crying out for? Mama. To which he said, she's miles away, son. She can't hear you. Push your bike back up here. Dad, push your bike back. Here, I'll carry your leg for you. But push the bike back up here. And then, guys, what did he do? He pushed me again. And you see, failure was actually part of my success. Just like you. We've all failed. But failure doesn't define you unless you drop your anchor and say, this is where I'm staying. I'm going to let this define me the rest of my life. I am a failure. Failure only defines you if you allow it. Failure is only a step to success if you keep moving. Keep moving. Move your feet. Look at your neighbor and say, move your feet. feet. Don't stop. Don't stop. Even if you've failed, it doesn't define you. Say it. I may have failed, but that doesn't define me. I'm not a failure. I don't quit. I don't give up. I keep moving from one failure to my next success. God said, let go of your failures. They don't define you. That isn't who you are. The worst decision in your life does not have to define who you are. Let it go. Sometimes failures are just another way of saying, I was rebellious. How many of you here were ever rebellious? When you've made wrong steps out of rebellion, God says, let it go. Let it go. Get your index finger. Tap a little and tell yourself, let it go. Forget about it. Let me tell you something. Everybody look at me. If you'd have put on the sign, there's going to be somebody here Sunday handing out gold coins. They'd be standing in line to get in. But that is exactly what I'm doing. What I've just shared with you will be of more value than anything you buy at Rich's or Macy's. Multiple value over anything you'll buy at a car lot or off of eBay. Because what I've shared with you can change your life forever. Forget your sins. Forget the sins of others. Forget your failures. Let it go. It no longer defines you if you keep moving. What did Paul say? This one thing I do. I'm forgetting anything behind me. Why? So I'm pressed towards what's ahead. How many of you know the Israelites couldn't go in the promised land until they got out of Egypt? You can't walk in God's blessings unless you let go of the slavery of your life. Wave your hand and say, I know that's right. And I told you there's four things God said you need to forget. Fourth one. Now, in advance, I will tell you this is going to be weighted towards the testosterone in the room. Because number four is God wants you to forget your success. I mean, all are going, what? And every man in this room is going, does this mean I have to take the plaque down? Can I still use the employee of the month parking space? Am I still the number one man in regional sales? Uh, let me ask you, Lynn, does he ever help you with the dishes? Excellent. You're well-trained, aren't you, brother? Let me shake your hand. I like that. (laughs) Let me shake yours. You've done a fine job. Very impressive. All right, well, let's just go with this. We're we're doing it old school here. We're washing. You're washing. He's drying. Um, Can you pretend? And you, sir? I like like how she answered willy-nilly. Sure. He, on the other hand, looked at her and gave it some thought before he said, 
Yes, I can pretend. <laughs> I like that, a wise man. Uh, so here's the deal. You're washing cups and saucers. Nothing difficult here. Pretty innocuous. Cups and saucers. You're washing, so you hand him the saucer, and he's drying it. Now, every man in this room knows drying a saucer is about as easy as it gets, isn't it? You simply dry it, you put it up in the cabinet. However, next is a coffee cup. And this is a different affair altogether. Because how many of you men know that you don't simply take a coffee cup and dry it and then put it up willy-nilly in the cupboard? No. You put that cup up, sir, with the handle perpendicular to every other cup in that group. At least that's the way it was explained to me. <laughs> so here he is. He's drying that cup. Now, he's aware the entire time he's drying that she's looking at him. And you're familiar with the look, aren't you, sir? You know you are. That's right. Under his breath, I heard, uh, yeah, you are. You're very, very familiar with the look. He, in fact, feels. He's not looking at her. He knows at a time like this, you don't make eye contact. Just look straight ahead and dry the cup. But he can feel the holes being bored that have come all the way out the other side, and he can smell the smoke coming out of these two holes. Nonetheless, none deterred, he's drying the cup. But his guys, we're not good at multitasking. And so while he's drying the cup, he's trying to think, put it up with the handle facing right. And so he's drying, and unwittingly, he drops the cup. However, like a cat, he moves quickly and catches the cup before it hits the floor with his finger through the ring. And he holds it up and goes, look at that. Would you look at that? I'm like a cat. I'm telling you, I could have been a pro. Seriously, I could have been. Did you see that? Did I ever tell you? It was homecoming, second quarter. We were down two touchdowns. And then the coach said, and at this point, Lindsay goes, oh, oh, wait, wait. Kids, bring the trophy. Bring the newspaper clippings too. Dad's going to tell the story again. You see, every guy in this room, Philip, you got yours, don't you, brother? You know you do. Every man in this room has stories. We may get up and walk like Quasimodo, oh, but we all got stories. And you know what God's saying? Forget it. Why? Why would God want you to forgive, excuse me, to forget your success? Because your greatest one is ahead of you. Tell me your name, sir, right here. John. John came to me before service. He said, the last time you preached here, I was eat up with cancer. He said, but I'm not today. I said, you know what you're doing today, John? He said, what? I said, you're living for Jesus. But how many of you know, that may not be the last battle this man ever faces. How many of you know, when the Israelites crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land, Jericho was still ahead of them. There were still giants in the land. In fact, after Joshua and Caleb died, there were still giants in the land. In other words, just because you've won a victory today, doesn't mean you don't have one tomorrow. But take heart. Say this to me. My greatest blessings are ahead of me. My greatest prosperity. Biggest paycheck I've ever got. Philip, are you out of work right now or are you working? Say this. In fact, what's your wife's name? Kelsey? Look her right in the eye right now. Philip said, baby, count on me. Stick with me. My biggest paycheck is the one ahead. Amen. Show her your hands a minute, Philip. Tell her, see, these are blessed hands. Kelsey, tell them they are blessed hands. Tell them, say, everything you touch, baby, prospers. Everybody say it. My healthiest days, My healthiest days. they're ahead of me. Ahead of me. My, most My most productive days, where are they, church? Ahead of me. Where's the best joke you ever heard? Headache. Best biscuit you ever had? Headache. Best sweet tea you've ever drunk? Headache. Glory to God. 
God's saying, let go of yesterday. Paul's saying, this one thing I do, forgetting whatever's behind me, I press towards what's ahead. Bow your heads, close your eyes. I've had in dreams God reveal how to minister, but this was the first and only time God's woke me straight up, gave me something, and I went right back to sleep. But when I got back up and I read it again, I realized this is profound. As simple as it is, profound. Because much of humanity is dealing with the past. Problems in marriages. It's the reason people are in counseling. It's the reason people are angry. It's the reason people are committing suicide. Alcoholics cannot forget the past. God's saying, I'm made a way. What you thought was forever broken, I can fix. What you thought was forever lost, I can restore. But Paul said, this is what I've learned. You must forget what's in the past so you can press on towards what's ahead. With your heads bowed, with your eye closed. I know God directed me to minister this this morning because there are people in this room who needed to hear it. I don't know who you are, but you do. No one looking around. But if you know this is for you, let me remind you what I said at the outset. It would be better for you to hear and respond than to hear and not respond. Because once you've heard, you're accountable. God said, I'm looking for people who don't just hear the word, but people who respond, people who obey. So with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you know this was for you, if you know God directed your feet here today and, and directed mine to be here as well, to speak this, if you know this was for your life, then I want you to do something simple. I'm not going to make you stand up. We're done with that. I'm not going to make you come to the front. But if you know this is for you, I want you to do something simple. Just raise your hand where you're seated. Do it now. Amen. All over the room. Can I be bold? It was for all of you. It was for me. It was for Pastor John. And for those of you who don't have your hand up, yes, this was for you. Because if you're not currently, currently dealing with this, you will be soon. And you know you have in the past. Every one of us in this room faces this challenge daily. Will you live in the now? Or are you going to allow yesterday to rob you? God's saying, let it go. Father, I thank you for these precious people. I thank you for their attention span and the attentiveness with which they've listened. I pray, Father, that these four things that they've written down would stick with them past this week, past this month, but the rest of their lives. When they hear themselves start to say, I may forgive I pray you remind them of today. Quicken them, O oh Father, that you've said you not only forgive, but you forget. And so we shall as well. I never ever minister with the assumption that everyone in church knows Jesus because I know for 18 years I went to church lost. So I'm not assuming today just because you're here, keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'm not assuming just because you're here that you're born again. Because I know odds are there's somebody here who is not. There's somebody here that you can't rewind your life and say, well, you see, Kim, it was right here. This is when I came face to face with Jesus. Let me tell you about how Jesus came into my heart. There's somebody here who can't tell that because it's never happened. But here's what's cool. You don't have to fill out any forms. There's no lines to stand in. The same apostle Paul said, here's all you have to do. You just have to believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth. And you can be born again. So if you're here today and you feel a knocking on your heart, perhaps like you have previous in your life, that's God. That's the Lord saying, son, this is for you. I've been waiting at the end of the driveway every day for you to come home. Come home to me today. Let me love you. Let me forgive you. Let me restore you. Let me heal you. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus in your heart, but you're ready, 
You're ready to live and not die. You're tired of your past governing your life. If that's you, I want you to do something simple. Where you're seated again. Just raise your hand where I can see it. I want to pray with you. Do it now. I see you. Church, pray. God's moving. I see you, young lady. Who else? Say, this is for me. I'm ready to ask Jesus in my heart. I never rushed this. The night I got saved, the man had to ask three times before I responded. If you're here today and you've not turned your full heart towards God, there's not a time in your life that you know that you know you said, fix me, I'm broken. I won't embarrass you. I'm not going to make you come to the front. I'm going to pray for you where you're seated. Is there anybody else that say, this is for me? I'm ready. The Bible says when just one person says yes, every angel in heaven rejoices. We got one young lady. I want everybody in the room to say this to me. Father, I thank you for loving me. So much that you would send your son to die. I believe that's what he did. He died for me. His blood was shed for me. He was resurrected for me. So I could have eternal life. I believe that in my heart. And I'm confessing it with my mouth. That I'm forgiven. I'm a new creation. My old man's dead. I'm free in Jesus' name. I want everybody to raise both hands. Keep your eyes closed. But thank God today for loving you. Thank him for whoever it was that looked at you and prayed that prayer with you. Maybe it was Pastor John. Maybe it was a pastor as you were growing up. Maybe it was your mate. Maybe it was some other evangelist. But whoever that was that loved you enough to say, you don't need a program, you need Jesus. You don't need another program. You need Jesus. Thank God for whoever that was. And can I be so bold? Thank God for who he's going to use in your life for you to lead them to Jesus the rest of this year. Four months left, four and a half. Who are you going to lead to Jesus this year? Who are you going to be an example to? Thank God today that he's using you to reproduce that heaven could be full and hell empty. Father, for that, we give you glory today. Everybody say, it's done done. in my life. life. Amen. Amen. I appreciate, as I said in the outset, your pastor giving me the privilege to come. He will tell you that I've never said to him, in any of the 17 years I've come here, brother, i got to have this to come. And yet, this is my life. I'm just going to speak freely with you. This is my livelihood. For 29 years... This is my life. I don't do this on the weekend and then I do a real job during the week. This is my life. This is it. Everything our ministry does, everything I share with you at the outset is all done from the overflow, from the giving of people like you. It is not only how we live in our livelihood, how we pay our bills and eat and do everything you and I both do. But over that is made possible through people like you. When the Lord called me to ministry, here's what he said to me. He said, son, don't ever tell them what you think. He said, I only want you to tell them what I said. And he said, if you tell them what I said, then I will speak to them to bless you. And he's kept his word to that. Incredibly, God's never written me a check. God's never handed me a $100 bill. He said, that's what my people are for. He said, you obey God. Obey me and speak my word. I'll speak to them to bless you. So that's my request today. I already know God keeps his word, so I believe he's speaking to every one of you here. I do. I don't care where you are in your life. I believe God's speaking to you. And all I'm asking you is whatever he says, do it. Amen. Amen. Do the offering however you want. We're going to play a song before we go home, brother. Y'all give Kim Cloud a great hand. I'll tell you what. I like that confession. Kim, you have preached some good messages here, brother. But that's the best message you have ever preached here, brother. In fact, I think it's one of the best messages I've ever heard in my life. If you need a cash envelope for your giving, just raise your hand. These gentlemen will wait on you. The rest of you that are writing checks, make that payable to church on the word. He will get every dime of it, and we will add to it. And he'll be blessed.
While you're preparing your checks, I want to tell you, Kim, Brother Copeland ministered the same thing about forgiveness at the Southwest Believers Convention. And he talked about the, Na the Native American Indian. Really? He sure did. He said, there are some, he said, you're Native American. And he said, you still have not forgiven Andrew Jackson for the Trail of Tears. And we experienced that in Cave Spring, Georgia. We were at the little historical society and went in and saw John Littlefoot. I was going to buy some uh, arrowheads for the grandkids. I handed him a $20 bill. He said, respectfully, if you'll take that across the street right there and get it changed, we don't take that in the store. He needs to forgive a man that died in 1845. He needs to forgive him. He, with, with respect, I, we don't take that in here. Go across the street, please. Take, get that changed. The man, I'm talking about a man that's alive today. John Littlefoot, Native American Indian. His family had to move out of Cave Spring, but his immediate family pledged allegiance to the United States. But because all their family left and a lot of them died, their family have held that all those years. He needs to forget, doesn't he? Absolutely. Let it go. Let it go. Y'all ready to give to this man of God? It's going to be a great seed to sow today. It'll be a fabulous seed. Father, I, I received the offerings of the people on his behalf. Thank you for sending this evangelist. You proved us once again that you love us enough to bring the other offices of ministry in here to help me. You bless the people today. Thank you, sir. We receive it because, like Kim said, you the man. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Go ahead and wait on the people. Turn your bass up, brother.
in them, don't it? <laughs> All right. Kim's uh, books and tapes and whatever he's brought are available to you in the back to take time to spend a little time with him and talk to him on your way out. I speak a blessing over you in Jesus' name, and I tell you, Wednesday nights are a good service. There's coming a Bible college here in September, and there's going to be a six-week course on the Holy Ghost and His gifts. I want you to start praying about it now. I release you in the name of the Lord Jesus. God bless you. I love you. See you Wednesday night.